Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, and thank you for joining to us uh, joining us tonight. My name Kate is Katie, and I'm a bookseller from The Novel Neighbor. Um, tonight, we welcome Jennifer Dassel to our virtual stage. Uh, Jennifer Dassel is the curator of modern and contemporary art at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the host of the independent podcast Art Curious, which she started in 2016, and which was named one of the best podcasts by O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, and PC Magazine. She holds an MA in art history from the University of Notre Dame and a BA in art history from the University of California, Davis. She has also completed PhD coursework in art history at Pennsylvania State University. And she lectures frequently on art both locally and nationally. And Art Curious, which is an amazing book that you will <laughs> love if you haven't read it yet, is a wildly entertaining and surprisingly educational dive into art history as you've never seen it before. From the host of the beloved Art Curious podcast, Art Curious is a colorful look at the world of art history revealing some of the strangest, funniest, and most fascinating stories behind the world's greatest artists and masterpieces. Through these and other incredible, weird, and wonderful tales, Art Curious presents an engaging look at why art history is, and continues to be, a riveting and relevant world to explore. So Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us tonight. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I just absolutely loved reading your book. And each chapter was more fascinating than the last from Monet to Warhol to from Mona Lisa to the Garden of Earthly Delights. You just <laughs> highlight some fascinating stories from art history. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to write. I am, but I feel like I'm the target audience because I am a, such an art nerd. So for me, I felt like I got to learn so much that I even didn't know. So it was such a treat to write. And so it makes it me so happy to hear that it was a joy to read. That's all I could have ever asked for. <laughs> um, so I love the story that you tell of um, Jackson Pollock's involvement in the Cold War and the CIA's involvement in which art was sort of presented and visible to the public as a type of propaganda. And so I was wondering, do you think there are current artists that the CIA are using? And if so, which Ooh. artists? Ah, that is such a good question. Yes, so basically, really long story short, the CIA very covertly used abstract expressionist art, especially people like Pollock and Rothko and Barnett Newman, sort of the big American artists of mid-century to basically show the rest of the world, but especially communist USSR, that uh, American art was best because it could be free and expressive and not show anything in particular and not be art representing a social scene or some sort of realist or propagandistic message. And so what they did was they kept it really secret from a lot of artists as well as the people who were looking at the art that was being traveled all over the world. And so I feel like if you had that precedent and it was kept secret for 50 plus years and it was only declassified, I think in the late nineties, early two thousands. So you gotta wonder that they kept it secret for that long. It appears to have been successful based on just the fact that they were able to tour around these works of art and show these exhibitions for like 20 years in a lot of, countries that I suppose you could say were kind of on the fence as to what was better, communism, socialism, or capitalism. So I would think that there's got to be something out there similar that's going on that's very below the radar. But it makes me wonder, because during the day, as you mentioned in your intro, my specialty is modern and contemporary art. So I am thinking a lot of the time in my day job about work that's being created right now. But I don't know, I feel like it's even harder in some ways to come up with something that's gonna be that undercover without people knowing. But I suppose the CIA could do it if anybody's gonna do it. <laughs> so many of the artists I feel like I particularly am looking at are people who are so clearly reacting or um, engaging with what's happening at this very moment. So I feel like you'd have to have some kind of alternative government that is addressing the opposite. So I would think it would be maybe something in the Middle East mm -hmm. that they're trying to show some of the freedoms, uh, you know, feminism, um, racial equity, parity between classes, things like that in a society that maybe doesn't have that to the same degree, even though our own society, we're all still working on it, right? So, hmm, 
that's one of the better questions I've been asked recently. I feel like I got to think on that one. Ooh. <laughs> really gets you, get you wondering. Right. Well, it's interesting too, you know, especially since a lot of people consider Jackson Pollock sort of my kid could do this type of art. Totally. Um, <laughs> which I don't think it's true, but nevertheless, my kindergarten class did do a Jackson Pollock style painting. And oh <laughs> how, how was your experience? <laughs> it was pretty awesome. You know, we made sure there was a fingerprint in the corner and a bug yeah. stuck under the paint and yes. it was auctioned off at the school fundraiser and has actually been in my parents' basement for almost 30 years. So I love that. I love that that was something that you remember and that your teachers were like, let's give this a try and how much fun that would have been for a kid. Mm -hmm. I have a a six-year-old and so I can only imagine that if I said here's a bunch of poster paint go make me a splatter painting he would just go nuts so oh I love that but I agree with you I think that's really one of the things about abstraction especially people like Pollock where it looks really simple and this was definitely my perception when I was first learning about art history too it just looks like you went bloop and splattered it all over the place but it's really fascinating if you ever see these really famous videos that a documentarian did of Jackson Pollock, it's almost like he's a ballet dancer, the way that he moves across the canvases because he spread them on the floor. And so it's almost like he's dancing across them as he's splattering. And there is this rhythm to it. And he even called number of his paintings rhythm or, or having something to do with that sensation of movement and music and melody. And you know, scientists, I don't talk about this much in the book, but what's really interesting is that scientists have done studies, just kind of visual optical studies of those paintings and have found that there's all kinds of scientific connections to them from fluid dynamics to the laws of physics and also uh, just musical connections. So there is something that's so specific to the way that Jackson Pollock actually made these works that look so simple that's actually rather complicated but you would never know from just standing in front of one and looking at it and so i think that dichotomy to me is so interesting simple yet complicated both are true at the same time it's really cool well and it keeps people looking at it you know there's a yeah. reason that it hasn't besides the cia that <laughs> it hasn't you know fallen into the, like the depths of history is that you know there's something about the simplicity of it but the complication just keeps people looking Exactly. And I feel like it's one of those things that I do see something different every time. Like you're talking about the bugs stuck in a corner. You know, sometimes they find ash in there from his cigarettes that were always just kind of dangling out of his mouth. You can find footprints on there from when he stepped on the canvas. So you get these little tangible moments of real life and of the artist himself, which is also super cool. So it becomes this biographical moment in some ways. I love that. That's awesome. Speaking of little bits of himself, Andy Warhol. <laughs> I had, one of my favorites. <laughs> I had no idea that he had put together those time capsules. I didn't uh, know that either. It was a shock to me. And that's part of what's really fun is that it's like I've been studying art history for 20 years now, over 20 years, and I'm still learning new things. And it took another show. It took This American Life <laughs> for me to learn that Andy Warhol did these time capsules. And he did them for, you know, over a decade before he died. And he kept everything. It's crazy. Like really kept everything. Everything from what you would normally expect. So like a newspaper clipping or something that you feel like would be important. So a letter from a friend or a birthday card but then he would keep a lot of things that I would never consider keeping, like actual trash, things that you would probably not want to keep, like moldy food, um, toenail clippings, like hair from a haircut. He kept it all. And it's amazing to me. If you hear scratching, it's my cat. Let's continue <laughs> talking while I let her in. She loves Zoom. So everyone can... Meet my tabby named Memers. She oh, I also have a tabby. <laughs> <laughs> my cat, I swear, every time I do one of these Zoom conversations, she comes in. So in about 30 seconds, there will probably be a cat tail that's like flipping in front of the camera. So apologies. <laughs> but yeah, Warhol's time capsules. Who knew? 
so, you know, going through the listings, you know, there's so many time capsules, so many items. If you could own one item from one of his time capsules, what would it be and why? Oh, man. I mean, I'm tempted to say something just so bananas, like um, he has a Miss Piggy time capsule that's just dedicated to Muppet stuff, but especially wow. Miss Piggy Muppet things. And I think that is so random that I kind of love it. Like I would want a Miss Piggy puppet that Andy Warhol had. Mm -hmm. But I think the the art, art historian in me would want something like another image or an article. So there was a famous painting he did um, called, I think, 128 Die in Jet. I can't remember if that's the exact number. It's uh, uh, basically an image of a plane accident that he used as a basis for one of his most famous screen prints that he had done, screen printed painting. So I think I'd probably like that just as this kind of archival moment. But that does sound kind of boring also. Miss Piggy. I'm going to Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy. <laughs> yeah. More fun. Weirder story. <laughs> what would you choose based on, I guess, what you know about? I don't know. I I would have to say maybe something related to his Marilyn Monroe artwork. Oh, yeah. It's just That's a good choice. It's so iconic and gorgeous. And yeah, you can't go wrong with it. You wouldn't want Caroline Kennedy's moldy sweet 16th birthday cake? I would not. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. Again, very interesting. Interesting choice to archive away, but I don't yeah, think. Yeah, just random bits of trash. Like, I don't think that really wouldn't be. <laughs> no, no. But it's also super interesting just to kind of get an idea of what this famous artist would choose. And it does, as I write in the book, it kind of gives you this look at this particular person in a way that we otherwise would never get to see because right. he very much crafted his like, you know, epitome of cool wig, sunglasses image so well. And so a lot of people didn't get to know the real Andy Warhol. And I think most people didn't know that he kept these time capsules except for a few of his employees until after he died. So it becomes this really cool glimpse and also a cool almost installation artwork in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Really interesting guy, obviously. So cool. <laughs> um, one of, I think, the most timely chapters is actually about Norman Rockwell. Um, <gasps> And how we think of him really solely as like that sentimental and sometimes cheesy artist for the Saturday Evening Post. Um, when I had no idea, he was very socially conscious, um, especially about the civil rights movement. Yeah. I had never actually seen or heard of Murder in Mississippi until I read your book. Yeah. Um, do you think today's world really needs to be reintroduced to his later paintings? I do, because I think that, uh, I mean, definitely I grew up looking at an album that my grandparents kept of the their favorite Saturday Evening Post covers and images just as a kind of a joke. There were things that I just laughed at and enjoyed. Oh, cat time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I never knew any other side of Norman Rockwell until about 10 years ago when an exhibition came to my museum, the North Carolina Museum of Art. And you could see that there was a little bit of volleying back and forth between some of the curators on staff where it was like, I'm not doing a Norman Rockwell show. Well, I'm not doing it. Who's going to curate it? Because people really don't like to see him as a fine artist. He's seen sometimes as just an illustrator, which is such a gross way of putting it because illustrators are most definitely artists, same words in many ways, same language. And uh, I think he was seen as just being somebody who was so commercially successful that they couldn't really have this amazing place in art and art history. I think there's a lot of artists even today that we still act in that kind of highfalutin way about. But Norman Rockwell, I think, is one of the big ones. But, you know, he left the post at the beginning of the 60s and went to go look or uh, work for Look magazine. A lot, I think, of that had to do with the fact that his wife at the time, it was his third wife, was very liberal. And so she was more interested in social issues and social justice. So she pushed him more in that direction. And I think it really was this eye-opening moment where this man who basically built his career on trying to visualize what America was, you know, like the epitome of what the American life is, 
was really all of a sudden realizing that he was only showing this tiny, tiny idealized tidbit of a country that was really in the early to mid sixties, a lot was going on, right? Mm -hmm. So I agree, he's done a few, especially really famous works of art. One I think that most people are probably more aware of is the image of Ruby Bridges going to school on her first day and you know being escorted by US Marshals. But Murder in Mississippi, I had never seen up to the point of this exhibition and it is, stark like if no one has ever seen it before i urge you to google the image because it's not what you would expect from norman rockwell and it's immediately shocking and so i think that's what really got me interested because it's not the norman rockwell you think you know mm -hmm. so yeah i think we should give him another chance Definitely. and what better time than now like you're saying i mean the the events of the past year especially we yes. deserve to look it's it's just it's a perfect time for sure well and was it in um that one or a different painting that he used his son as one of the models yes it was that was for murder in mississippi mm -hmm. so he basically um used photography as the basis for most of his paintings and so he would hire models or just ask for volunteers for models for most of his stuff here comes the cat that was her wiggling my table mamers Enjoy. Um, but yeah, there's basically murder in Mississippi is three figures, all of whom it was based on a real life event when these three workers, they're two, um, two black people, one white person who were being uh, uh, working for the cause of social justice for something called um, CORE, C-O-R-E. And they were in Mississippi trying to advocate for voters' rights, especially for Black voters. So again, talk about timely. Uh, and the KKK found out what they were doing and went out and basically lured these three men in and took them to a field and executed them, essentially. So it was a real event. It was real big news. And Rockwell almost immediately took notice of this. And you can see that he actually kept clippings from newspaper of this reports of these deaths. So it was something that really shocked him and meant something to him. And he spent months working and trying to perfect this canvas that eventually he would go on and show a version of it in Look Magazine. And he was normally a guy who worked on, you know, like two or three, maybe even four canvases at once. So he had a lot of balls in the air and he stopped everything to work just on this one image. So it was really important for him and he really tried to get it right. And I think it's one of the ones that we don't know as much or we don't really learn about as much when we talk about Norman Rockwell. And I think it deserves a real second chance. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. It's just, I've, well, the, there's a copy of the picture in the book and then I went and I looked it up online as well to see, you know, bigger. And yeah. I just like, it's one of, it's a painting that's so moving. You just immediately want to tear up and just. Yes how did this happen? How does this continue to happen? It's, you know, art history isn't just history. It's, you know, present day as well. Absolutely. And it, it's big too. If you actually get the chance to ever stand in front of it in person, it's not a small little work. It's not something you're just going to hang on like side of your wall next to your bookshelf. It's a big piece. So you have no choice but to be confronted with it and to stand there and take it in. So yeah, seeing it in person and seeing it in color, even though it is almost a black and white work in and of itself, it's very sparse in its color. But that's also what makes it so shocking, I think, is because he makes it look like a newspaper photo, except that you get a little bit of red in there from blood. And so it's just, it's shocking. That's really all I can say about it at this point. It's just sort of like words fail you when you yeah. actually get to experience this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> my pleasure, for real. I mean, it's, uh, it, it is, it does get kind of a bad rap, I think, um, Rockwell in general as an artist. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, I, I think, again, it's sort of that commercialization and the fact that he wasn't, you know, a painter painting important art for museums. You know, he was a guy who was making his living as a graphic designer and was publishing weekly for the Saturday Evening Post and then other 
you know, other places later. And so there is that divide between what was considered a pop art and high art and low art, and fine art. There's all these divides in the art world that I think now are starting to blur a lot more. And so people, I think, are a lot more accepting these days of what can be considered art. And, and I think that's a really great thing, first of all. But I think also that's really been something that people like Norman Rockwell and a lot of other artists in the past 50 years have been working really hard to do is really making art more encompassing. Because for the longest time, it was like, are you a person who paints in oil paints? And are you a sculptor who creates work in marble or bronze? You are a real artist. And of course, we know that there's so many other ways to make art. So that's also one of the things I really like about Norman Rockwell is because you get the opportunity to say that he's just as much of an amazing artist as another guy, mm -hmm. as Andy Warhol, as Jackson Pollock, he's just oh, doing definitely. things differently. Yeah, he's almost yeah. sort of an artistic anthropologist just in his, yes. you know, how he captures American life and he does capture some of the wonderful cheesy moments that happen inside everybody's homes, but then he's capturing what's happening on the streets every day as well. Totally, exactly. I know, it, because it really does give you those idealized versions like you're talking about, but then towards the end of his life, he really shook it up. And also you've got to respect a guy who was in his 60s or 70s and deciding to start making a change like that, that yeah. must have been terrifying, I think, Definitely. for somebody who was really striking out on his own so late in life. It takes guts. Mm -hmm. Yes, it definitely does. <laughs> um, switching gears a little bit. So one of the chapters was on spiritualism mm -hmm. and sort of art behind that. And do you do you think that there are other similar movements that were, you know, more actually spearheaded by women? Um, Ooh. I, I think, it yeah. makes me think a lot of actually, well, an author, but um, how there's a lot of commentary now about how Zelda Fitzgerald was actually the brains behind F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I'm thinking, oh, there's got to be artists like that too. <laughs> 100%. And by the way, you were speaking to my heart because I am a big Fitzgerald fan family fans. So I love Scott Fitzgerald and I love Zelda. She is definitely underrated. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Well, something that I think is really interesting that I kind of tangentially touch on in a little sidebar in the book is that I think about five or 10 years ago, there was a group of anthropologists and archaeologists from Penn State who went and they started studying cave paintings. But more specifically, they were looking at handprints in caves. So ancient cave art really began, um, you know, we think of things like images of horses and bulls that were painted on the walls, but alongside those, and often for hundreds of years before that, the first things that people did was they made little impressions of their hands. And they went in and there's some correlation, and it's not exact for sure, but there's some correlation with the fact that women's ring fingers are I guess larger or shorter, I can't remember which. I gotta, I gotta look up my own book. But something about uh, the finger length corresponds differently in women than in men. And so by studying those ancient handprints, they were able to determine that women more often than not appear perhaps to be the ones who are making those cave paintings. And so to me, that's amazing because I think when we think of cave paintings, we get this sort of cartoony, Fred Flintstone idea that it's like a caveman going, making art, yay. And it's so ridiculous. Yeah. But even though that's such a movie thing and a cartoon thing, I think we still use it as a degree to consider who we think a cave painter is. It's like this Neanderthal guy. Mm -hmm. And it might actually be a woman. And I think that's really cool. So if you talk about something that was really established by women, you could go far enough to say that women are the very first artists. Well, and it makes sense too when you think about who was foraging for the berries that they use for dye and who knew exactly. the plants and all the local, you know, resources. It exactly. and they weren't out hunting, they were in the cave taking care of everybody. So totally. So exactly. It's like they were the ones who were home and home were those caves. I love that. I think that's very cool. And it's also just 
it not only does it make sense, but it's also just a wonderful opportunity to kind of disrupt the idea of art. And that's something that I think we've seen so many amazing opportunities of in the past few decades, especially just opening things up really to give a different view of who art is for, who has been making art and all of the different voices that for the longest time really have been kind of pushed off to the side. Mm -hmm. And so really thinking about ancient art as much as you're thinking about art that was made 100 years ago, 200 years ago, still is the same process. We're still trying to let in this sensation of diversity and all these disparate voices in to the oldest art as much of anything else. Oh, and I, I listened to your little short on the uh, Venus of Willendorf. And so that, that you know, made me think of that because, you know, it's so iconic and I even have a little figurine of it that I, I got. And it's one of those things like, oh, what is this representation representation of women? Even yeah. from the earliest days that we've seen. Yeah, no, it's true because if you've seen, if anybody knows this figurine, it's this really iconic, it's actually tiny. It's just only a few inches tall, but it's this like super rounded, very voluptuous woman, like really big breasts, a real big behind. And for the longest time, it was really assumed to have been like a fertility figure. And they call her Venus because they thought it was like a goddess, fertility goddess figure. And that may very well have been part of its intention. But also, again, in recent years, these new discoveries, you know, scientific advances and new ways of looking at things have allowed us to kind of disrupt those old assumptions about art. And one of them is that the Venus of Willendorf may have almost been just like a little symbol or a representation of the ideal woman because it was created in Europe at a time where people were really in the ice age. So having some extra body fat was the way to ensure survival for their communities. And so it was considered almost like a talisman and that young women would be given them examples of basically propaganda in some ways of how they should best look. So I was saying, you know, it's interesting because we see images every day that are telling us how we should look and how we need to lose weight and what the ideal female form is. And this is similar, but it was for a completely different purpose and one that is very noble in, in <laughs> I guess, correspondence, which was that it wasn't anything vain. It wasn't for the necessarily to appeal to men, but it was could literally have been for the survival of the human race. And that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. <laughs> it could be both, but I like this new interpretation. <laughs> yes, it's very body positive. <laughs> like, yeah, again, another work of art for our time. <laughs> um, so I know um, something you sort of get into a little bit in the book in the introduction um, is you wanna make art more accessible to people. Yeah. Because a lot of time I think there, and there is, if not actual elitism, perception of elitism. And I think that makes a lot of people afraid to step inside of an art museum just because they're like, oh God, is someone going to say something to me or look at me funny or... Totally. Um, so what would you say to the person who's afraid of stepping inside of an art museum? I feel like I'd say a couple of things. The first is that art is for everyone regardless of whether or not you see yourself represented in a work, there is something in a museum that will speak to you. The other thing is that I feel like people are really scared sometimes, and I I used to feel this way too, so I completely understand, is that you sometimes get worried that you're, if you're not gonna understand it is one thing, but that you're, if you don't like something, that for some reason you're doing it wrong. Like you're supposed to like everything that you see on view at an art museum. And that is 100% not true. If you do like everything, then yay, but you don't have to. And I think there's so many works of art that are meant to make you feel uncomfortable, especially contemporary art, which again is really dealing in a lot of what's difficult or what's interesting or challenging about living today. Uh, so I often tell people, I just want you to look. And if you don't like something, you can move on. But that also is good if you if you feel like you're not liking something. If you're looking, that means that you're having a reaction. And any reaction to art is good. You can laugh at it. You can say, I don't like it. You can say, this is beautiful. You could say, this is terrible all of those things are valid. So I always just want to, people to feel like they can 
feel however they want to feel. And that as long as they're looking and they're engaging with it on a one-on-one -on -one level, that makes all the difference. And then I want people to also know that there's not just one way to look at art. And even though, you know, a wall label or a docent or a volunteer will tell you, you know, the artist meant this when they were painting this painting, that that's only one interpretation. Even if the artist is saying, this is the only thing I was considering when I was sculpting this bust of a man, that doesn't mean that your thoughts on it aren't equally valid. So I love when people come in from the outside and they're looking at a painting that I feel like I've seen a hundred times and they'll tell me something new because it completely changes my perspective on a work that you know I thought I was an expert on. And nothing is better than that to me, this engagement with getting to feel what someone else understands about a work of art. Because that's what's really cool about art is not necessarily the piece itself, but our connection and our conversation with the piece of art. Yeah, I think that's where visual art and literature really, you know, have that crossover where, you know, the writer could have meant one thing and, but this is how you read it and you were in this situation in life and this is how yeah. you're going to interpret it. Well, it's the same thing with visual art. I mean, it's just, totally. it depends on where you are and who you are and, um, you know, what temperature the room is when you're when you're seeing it, you know. If you totally. Just what mood it, are you in? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think because of that, it's also kind of exciting because then you can come into a museum you've been in before and you get to have a completely different experience, even if you've seen a work before. Uh, yeah, it's like it changes every time. And I think that's really cool. I mean, I still feel like obviously museums, it, mine included, as well as pretty much almost every other museum that I know of, you know, we all have a long way to go to keeping things open and to representing our audience and what our audience looks like and who they are as much on the walls as anything else. So there's still definitely a lack of diversity that I think a lot of us are really trying to grapple with and right. work hard to fight against. Like we want to bring in more voices. We want to make a portrait of a old dusty white guy be more meaningful to an audience today. So it's definitely hard, but I really do feel like regardless of who you are, what your interest is in art, you know, whatever your level is or your knowledge of it, there will be something for you. Mm -hmm. And it can be as simple as looking at something and saying, I like the color red in that painting. Then moving on. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. That's enough. That's you connecting with that work of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you can also see something multiple times and never even notice it. And then one day you suddenly see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That happens to me all the time, you know, and I think part of what's been really interesting about the quarantine times is that that has really brought that idea like so clearly to my mind. So uh, we are going back to work full time at the museum this week, but I have been back only maybe 10 times in the past year. And I would go into the galleries and I would see work in a new way, or I would see small details that I'd never noticed before, like a bug on a still life painting that I had looked at 10 times in the last four, you know, four years and it becomes new again. So yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of the North Carolina Museum of Art, <laughs> Um, what is the weirdest object that you think you have in the gallery? Ooh, I feel like I can go in a different, like a few different directions in that. The first thing that comes to my mind isn't actually a work that we have in the collection at the museum, but it's a work that we have had on display before at the museum that I think is from a private collector. And it's a photograph by an artist named Anthony Goigalea. So he is a Cuban American artist. I think he's in New York now. And uh, so this is a contemporary work, but part of what was included on this piece, and I, I can't actually remember now if it was a drawing or a painting, or excuse me, a drawing or a photograph. I think it was a drawing on Mylar, but part of the work included dead flies that were glued to the work. This is the great thing about contemporary art is that right. anything can be art, obviously, and artists do present anything as art. So it's just really interesting. But we it's, it's really fun because we have a group of conservators who work on campus. Not every museum has 
uh, conservation team, but we do. And so it's uh, always entertaining to get their responses to works like that, where they're like, what am I supposed to do? There's a dead fly on here. I can't do anything about it. And I just have to let it go. And their job is to exterminate a lot of stuff. So it's, it's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> that's probably the weirdest I can think of right now. That's, that's a really good example. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. Um, I keep purring. I love it. I know, he's a very happy cat. <laughs> um, oh, let's talk about naked people. <laughs> I think that's my favorite line that's in the entire book. It starts off a chapter on Renaissance artists and how, you know, sort of dispelling the rumors that people like Leonardo da Vinci were stealing bodies from graveyards. Yes. I had never heard, you know, da Vinci. I heard, you know, later for medical research specifically, not just drawings, but right. yeah. Yeah. No, this is really funny. I think this chapter is an example of a story I went into when I was writing the first draft of the book that completely went off the rails because I was going to intend, I was intending to tell you the story about how Leonardo and Michelangelo and all of them did steal corpses for these kind of like secret art purposes, only to find out it like day one of my research for this chapter that that was a patent falsehood, that that was basically a myth. It's kind of like on par with people saying that the earth was flat and it was something that was uh, really brought to light in the 19th century when people were trying to look at the past in a more critical light in terms of a negative critical light, I suppose you could say. So they were thinking like, oh, the people in the Renaissance, they did all this stuff and we are so much more knowledgeable now. It was that kind of response. And so these ideas that these artists didn't know anything about bodies because the Catholic church was against it. And because the only way that they could have access to the naked figure at a time when they didn't really have like naked life drawing classes, the way that you would traditionally today, if you were learning to be an artist mm -hmm. was that obviously they had to steal corpses. And uh, it's really interesting. That's not true at all. And neither is it true that the church was against it. Actually, that's, amazing that the Catholic Church was actually a proponent of dissection and anatomy studies, basically because they led the way in having uh, dissections done on holy people, so especially women, some nuns, because they wanted to literally look to see if there was any evidence of God living in the body. So oh, wow. they, it's not like they were against it at all. They were doing it. They were part of this process and really establishing it. So it wasn't until much later that there was this idea of these secret artsy dissections going on. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it was something that was not only sanctioned, but artists would make friends and, um, you know, like community outreach in some odd way to people who were ill or to um, people who were working in hospitals. And they knew that if someone was going to pass away that they would go. And in the case of Leonardo, he actually became friends with someone who eventually died and had a conversation with him about the use of his body. And after the man died, he was able to do the dissection and learn about the way that the human body functions. So by no means was it this covert secret thing. They were actually receiving permission in many cases. And again, in Leonardo's case, like directly a one on one relationship. So I was <laughs> I grew up with this idea that it was totally opposite. So that was probably one of my favorite chapters to write because it completely upended my own personal understanding of Renaissance anatomy and how that worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's just amazing, too, because Leonardo, you know, we think of as an artist, but he's a scientist, uh, you know, he was interested in physics and just anything you could think of. I mean, yeah. there no, I mean, the true Renaissance man, really. I know. It's like the term had to have been invented because of him, because he did everything. And it's amazing because we do think of him, I think, as you're mentioning, like, predominantly as an artist today, because we have things like the Mona Lisa stuck in our brains as the most iconic and most probably familiar work of art in the world. And so when you actually think about it, he created so few works, so few paintings, especially. He mostly 
drew. He did a lot of drawings in his notebooks, the things that we call the codex, the codices. And so thinking about like solid real works of art, like you would see on a museum wall, you know, there's like about 20, maybe less than 20 works of art that you can actually see out there that are solid paintings or, or murals or um, frescoes in the sake of um, the Last Supper in Milan. So yeah, it's really interesting. He was so much more than an artist. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Oh, we've got a question from the comments section. Um, awesome. Was it hard to decide which stories to include in the book? Yes, yes. I mean, for sure, I knew that I wanted most of the book, and, and this was part of my uh, conversation with my editor at the very early phases, was that I wanted a lot of it to be new because I do this podcast and it is free, and so I wanted people to feel like they had a reason to buy a book and I wasn't just churning out the same stories that I had already told online. So I wanted to do something that I'd never done before. And in most cases, I already had just basic ideas of funny things that I enjoyed or things that I wanted to cover that were just inklings in the back of my mind. But in the case of some things, like the very first chapter is on the Impressionists, but especially taking you through the story of Monet and how the Impressionists developed into being really what were rebels at the time. They were completely anti-establishment in so many ways. And now, you know, 150 years later, I grew up thinking that they were just like pretty umbrellas and scarves would have haystacks and water lilies on them. And for me, they didn't make any sense other than to be just decorative, mm -hmm. only to find out when I started studying art history in earnest that these were like sincere badasses who didn't care what anybody thought and they created art in a totally new way. This, it was, this is a long way of saying that was a story that I had listed on just a piece of paper at the very beginning of the podcast, 2016, when I was first jotting down ideas for what I wanted the show to be. And that was one of the first ideas I wrote down. I never ended up doing it on the podcast. And I don't know why, but it was one of the first things that I came back to and was like, that's for sure what I'm covering in the book. And then I liked it so much, I ended up making it the first chapter. <laughs> so it was hard and not hard, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Such an unsatisfying answer, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Ta also, um, talking about Impressionists, so the um, chapter on Van Gogh was fascinating yeah. because, I mean, the fact that, you know, you grow up thinking he you know, had lots of mental issues and that he yeah. committed suicide. But, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people think that actually doing research later that he might have been murdered. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I remember when this story broke. It must have been about 10 years now. It was like art historical clickbait because all of a sudden everywhere you turned on every website that was reporting any kind of news, it would be like, was Van Gogh murdered in capital letters and mm -hmm. lots of bold print. And it was really funny because all of this came out because of a biography that these two authors had written. It's called Van Gogh, The Life. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even a major assertion that they made in this biography, which is really thick. I don't think I have my copy in front of me, but it's like a thousand pages. They buried this information in an appendix in the back. So people had to be really interested to find out this information. But it's really interesting because there are these kind of contradictory elements about the story of Van Gogh's suicide and people calling it at the time and saying that, you know, people who understood and met him and knew him only would refer to it as an accident and that Van Gogh, all of his items from the day that he was killed supposedly in this field never showed up. So there was never a weapon that he had supposedly shot himself with. Mm -hmm. There were never any of his art supplies when he was supposedly painting that day. And there were just some weird coincidences and non-coincidences. And the fact that the last letter that he wrote to his brother was very positive, even talking about the fact that he had just bought new paint supplies. So I get it and yet I don't because I understand how mental illness works and I understand depression is horrible and you never know what's gonna tip someone off over to the edge to having from a bad day into wanting to commit suicide. But it's a really interesting story that they do weave. And I don't want to give away too much information for anybody who oh. hasn't already heard the possible story that they tell. 
But I always love to give a teaser because it basically revolves around a recollection of a man who was a teenager at the point when Van Gogh died in the late 1890s, and uh, or excuse me, in the early 1890s. And he was a teenager who was grumpy and a little bit of a bully. And he had this obsession with cowboys and the Wild West. So let that just be enough. If you haven't already heard this story or, or read the chapter in the book or read the Van Gogh biography, uh, yeah, kind of like cosplay cowboy and see where that takes you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's yeah. one of the things I love so much about the book is that each chapter is just like a fun little nugget that you can, you know, you don't have to read it in one sitting. You can keep, you know, picking yeah. it back up again and... That's what I also wanted was that I wanted it to be something that was appealing, not only for people like me who already love art, but also for people who don't have any background in it or don't know anything about it so that you're learning things along the way, but that you're also just being entertained because there's so much more to art and art history than learning about, you know, like this painting is important because blah, 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 and learning, you know, very specific art world terms. That's great too. I did it. I love it. But being able to tell a fun story, I think that does even more to get you interested in learning further and learning more about Van Gogh's life. You know, you have to start by learning about his death or the theories behind his death to want to learn more about him and his work. Why not? Why not? Definitely. There's also a really good Doctor Who episode with Van Gogh, so. <laughs> yes, I haven't seen it, but I've had a lot of people tell me about it. I oh, think, I think it's very emotional. Oh yes, you will cry, but yeah. it is just, especially after reading your chapter, it's like, ooh. <laughs> I just, I guess tangentially related, just talking about the story of this theory of Van Gogh's death. It's really interesting to see in the past 10 years, just how much it's kind of taken on a life of its own. And so if you've seen any of the recent movies that have been around Van Gogh's life, so there was one called Loving Vincent that was an animated film, which is beautiful. So if anybody hasn't seen this movie, just see it for the animation alone because it's incredible. Uh, but also there was At Eternity's Gate with Willem Dafoe that was directed by an artist himself, Julian Schnabel. Mm -hmm. And both of those movies, sort of hint at this same story. So they're not taking that traditional Van Gogh committed suicide road and they're spinning it with this theory that these authors posited in this biography. So it's really interesting. And you know, I don't know what to believe. I don't know which one is true or not. I don't know if he committed suicide or if he was killed either accidentally or on purpose, um, but it's really interesting to see. And I don't know. We may never know for sure, but it's enough to keep us guessing, I think. It's really, really intriguing. Well, and it's kind of more, you know, it's better entertainment that way too. It's like yes. all the mysteries of the art world. And, totally. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> of the art world. Taking notes. Yes. <laughs> oh, and well, cause you did have a little uh, sidebar about the, um, the Gardner heist. Yeah. So like, that's another one that I was thinking of like, oh, I just watched a documentary on that. I was like, wow. oh, unsolved mysteries. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. This is a robbery is on Netflix. It is, mm -hmm. It's so good. I know. I am, I am with you. And there's so many different stories and, you know, big ones and small ones. It's like, there's a missing Leonardo da Vinci painting that's supposedly in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence that was super famous and that people even after like Peter Paul Rubens, a famous Baroque, Northern Baroque artist copied it. And yet we don't know where it is. We think it's kind of stuck behind a wall. And so that's one of the smaller mysteries, but then there's bigger mysteries like the, this is all Leonardo. Apparently I'm obsessed with Leonardo, but the Salvatore Mundi, the painting yes, most yes. expensive work of art ever sold, sold at auction in 2017 and we haven't seen it since. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's all these different stories. And I think because art or the art world in general is such an exclusive world that most of us, you know, everyday folks, we don't get to see, at least not to the degree that a lot of collectors or museum directors or I guess kings and queens and sultans mm -hmm. and so forth get to experience. It's just such 
an intri intriguing world because it's so unknown in so many ways, which is why I think documentaries about art like The Gardener Heist really give us this kind of behind the scenes look because there's so much that we just aren't able to personally experience about art, mm -hmm. sort of the monetary side of things for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so we're gonna switch little format, um, switch the format up a little bit. So okay. a couple of this or that questions. Oh, I'm um, so excited. Impressionism or pop art? Ooh, impressionism. Um, Van Gogh or Monet? Van Gogh. Ancient or modern? Modern. East or West Coast? Oh, West. Can't do it. West. California. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so some quick questions. What yeah. was the first art exhibit you remember visiting? Uh, a Monet exhibit when I was in San Francisco when I was a kid, and I thought it was boring because I was a kid. <laughs> Um, your favorite season? Fall. Uh, what do you order at a coffee shop? Oh, oat milk latte. That's about it. <laughs> I'm very boring. That's not boring. That's just tasty. <laughs> um, what music are you listening to most right now? Oh, always the Beatles. Always the Beatles. Number one. I go through phases. I'm in a Beatles phase right now. Well, you can't go wrong, so. I know, that's what I say. Um, what book are you bringing to a deserted island? Oh, The Great Gatsby. Yes. <laughs> I mean, um, so bad. I know, it's like so obvious in so many ways that it's ridiculous, but. I well, but it. there's a reason that it's considered one of the greatest novels of all time. I mean, right. Right. Not everybody's wrong about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. Gosh, it's like I'm picking the Great Gatsby. I'm picking the Beatles. Oh, come on. <laughs> gotta get cooler, really. I've got to get more like low key about stuff. <laughs> I'll work on that. Uh, well, what's your favorite meal to cook? Mm, vegan lasagna. Oh. With tofu that I crumble with some nutritional yeast. It sounds terrible. It is amazing. Well, that actually, that sounds, I've never had vegan lasagna before. We're really good. We're, we're a vegetarian household. And so we eat a lot of vegan veg stuff. And this stuff is amazing. And it makes me not miss the ricotta at all. Oh, that, that sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Send you the recipe. <laughs> um, post COVID, what's your first place to travel? Oh, I want to go everywhere. But basically, I think the first thing I want to do is just go sit on some kind of tropical beach and read eight books and drink some kind of tropical drink. That's all I want. I don't care where it is, wherever that it's cheap. Sounds amazing. I'll just I'll just have a babysitter. That's that's my dream. Oh my Thank gosh, you. I am with you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, zombies attack. What object in your museum of art are you saving? <gasps> oh my gosh, has to be something I can carry. There's this little tiny bronze Louise Bourgeois that hangs from a cord from the ceiling. She's like this big. I can carry her. She's cool. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> um, what aspect of being a podcaster has most surprised you? How hard it was to begin. I knew nothing about audio. I still don't know a lot about audio. And uh, I thought it would be easy. And it isn't. It's easier, but it's definitely a, um, a learning process for sure. Um, if there was one artist dead or alive you could have dinner with, who would you choose? Oh. Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun, which I think listeners of my podcast would laugh because I love her. I talk about her all the time. She was the court portraitist to Marie Antoinette and she survived the French Revolution. She is amazing. I love her. Awesome. <laughs> um, and then one last question sort of goes back to the music. What is your favorite piece of music other than booty tunes, of course? <laughs> of course, that's the number one song ever. And you have to read the book to get that story. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to my husband who named that chapter. And he was like, you have to call it booty tunes. <laughs> You're right, I do. Um, oh my gosh. I mean, I can't go something Beatles because how do you pick just one? So right. I would say going something totally different 
There is a clarinet concerto in A major by Mozart that is amazing. The second movement, I believe the number is 522, but I could be wrong because I'm not super knowledgeable about stuff, but I love this one particular piece, clarinet. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, we're at about time. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. This was um, so fun. Thank you so much for having oh, me. It was a blast. Um, go check out Jennifer's podcast, Art Curious, on whatever you know streaming source you use for your podcast. Um, and please make sure to pick up Art Curious. Just an amazing book. It'll be a great quick summer read for you. Um, and we have copies at the Novel Neighbor online or in the store. Um, Thanks everybody for watching and I hope you have just a wonderful evening. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.